What is up, down and sideways, you beautiful individuals? It is League Unlock. We are back. Eric and Mark here with you. And unfortunately, today we we took a little bit too much hopium, Mark, and we're feeling the effects today. The minute we were calling G2, maybe even favorites against T1, here we are with these results. Uh, it's a classic uh, medicine mix-up here. Too much of the hopium and the copium. You got to get yourself out and get some fresh air in this type of situation. And, well, G2, they've certainly got an opportunity in the next couple of weeks to go get some fresh air as they enter their MSI break now. We had to be grounded back and take a dose of reality. Um, yeah, we'll throw the um there. That, uh, <laughs> not my best, but we'll check that out. But this series really, to me, you can break it down to basically one sentence, and that is... The God of Thunder was awakened from Mount Olympus because this is a Zeus form that we have not seen, I'm going to say, in months probably. Yeah, flat out in months. I don't know if we've really seen it since we've had eight trucks dominate the top side, since we've had straight up laning phases, not talking about lane swapping phases going around across the map. Yes, this was a mega series for Mr. Zeus in the top side. He certainly ro rose up to the occasion compared to how he was at this whole tournament and big time on how he was individually against G2. That was a big one in this series the last time around. This time around, certainly the advantage in the favor of T1 in that top side from the performance of, as you said, the God of Thunder, Mr. Zeus. This first game, it's looking great for G2. Han Sama is disgustingly fed on Draven. He's got Mickey's Poppy to help him out. But Zeus Camille is the AD carry killer. It didn't matter how fed Han Sama was in all these fights. Zeus was equally or more fed on the Camille and team fight after team fight. He lands the Hextech ultimatum on Han Sama. And what are you supposed to do at that point? I think there's a certain point in this one where, again, T1 hasn't shut down Hansama, hasn't shut down the Draven enough early that he was able to get at least one, maybe two of these cash-ins in, get some of that advantage, have, you know, a plus 2,000 gold lead on, on Guma at that point. And then it was the Camille. As you said, Zeus just homing in onto that Draven, and we get a really close fight in that top river where Hans flashes into that bush up before top lane, trying to get that little bit of advantage. He doesn't have a ward. He doesn't have a ward. Oh, it was so close, but just enough for the Draven to go down. Zeus gets that one, and from that point on, they found a way every single team fight to get onto that Draven, blow him up, find a way to get the damage out of there from G2. And Cat, and you look at this one. Yes, Caps had an impact. He was per performing pretty well in this one, but you had to mention. Baker on that comfort, on that traditional Oriana. He might not have had any of the big flashy plays, but the damage and the comfort that he had in that mid lane, that was certainly noticeable compared to the shaky performances we have seen from him at this MSI. And, you know, you also had the spicy pick right from the get-go, yike on the Kha'Zix, but it never... He got that one kill early, but... This is, he's definitely a snowball type of jungler, and if you're not getting a lot of kill contribution early, he just didn't really ever get to have the impact. He's kind of not on the same page as G2, the rest of G2 for one of these fights, but 100% this first game is all about Zeus finding the angles to single out Han Sama and not let him do anything in these team fights. But despite that, there was still life from G2 in that second game. Another pretty decent Early game, they banned Cassante in game one. Zeus does get it on game two. And spoilers, he is absolutely deadly on it again. But early on, it was attention to the mid lane for Faker. He has a little greedy whoopsie trying to dive and kill Caps. And that was the one opening that G2 said, let's camp this dude. And the way that Caps and G2 have been playing at this event, that's all it took for them to build out an advantage, build out this chance for them to get back in the series in game two. They got the Aurelian Soul. Caps, one of the best that we like to see on this champion, picking up that stacking, getting that scaling in favor for G2. He's a real threat. The problem is, as you mentioned, Mr. Zeus was also a threat in this game. And you combine the, the combination of the draft that T1 had here, 
even having those advantages for G2, there never was going to be all that comfortable of a space for them to operate, for them to dictate exactly what was going to happen in this game. And it was only a matter of time until T1 found the magic team fight. And again, it was, you know, Hot Sama and Caps were both strong in this game, but Zeus, uh, Cassante, Poppy, and Alistair. It was a beefy boy lineup out of T1 that they just couldn't break through. They have the Miracle Base Defense on the Nexus, a Quadra Kill for Draven. It survives with basically a single auto, then regens a little bit, and then things go haywire for G2. They've got to rush the Baron. I feel like you have to just send Yike and Hansama. They can two-man Baron at this point, but Broken Blade goes with. You know Faker's going to TP. There's only one lane he can TP to. It's the top side. Only Mickey is left to base defense, and he just strolls in and hits the Nexus twice. It's a rock and a hard place type of situation for G2 for Broken Blade in that specific one, because yes, there's absolutely an incredible sense of urgency. Once you get that miracle, you make the base defense. T1 has made a little bit of that error, overstepping, over pushing as just those four, not having Faker there for that final push, which would have been the full clean end to the game. Without him, you've got a chance, you got an opportunity, but you gotta get something in the meantime while those death timers are high. Well, it only is that Azir out there, but you can't leave the base open because you do know that that is that possibility. He has the teleport. It is just one little speck of sand dropping off of Azir's robes to take out the Nexus at that point. Broken Blade, I think, makes that you know uh, mistake of a decision to start pushing up, gets out of position, recognizes, okay, I gotta get back there with the teleport, but it's far too late. At that point, there's not enough to be done, and it is a lost game two for G2, one where they held control and had more or less the driver's plan to get across the finish line and bring us to a one-to-one -one score before game three, but it's now that 0-2, the dreaded 0-2 hole against one of these LCK LPL teams, G2's gotta climb themselves out. And listen, it is far from a given that even if G2 gets that Baron, they're still in an uphill battle. They might not even, probably don't even win the game still. And in those scenarios, G2 probably thought they had already lost. When they get that Quattro kill, I'm sure it's chaos. Okay, we got to go get Baron, but we have to defend. In such a split-second decision-making, we see this all the time with Nexus defenses and crazy endings. There's so much going on. So understand that there could be that miscommunication, but yeah, then ends up being almost an even more painful loss. If they had just lost straight up uh, from that quadra kill, hadn't gotten it, maybe they're feeling a little bit better. But it didn't actually slow them down in game three because, again, they had a really good early game. Caps is Tristana with the double AD carry comp. He got so many turret plates. Early game macro, G2 was out playing T1. They were finding their advantages, finding the way to get that gold into Caps' pocket. This Tristana pick... We've seen it, uh, you know, a little bit around this event. We've certainly not seen anybody utilize it the way that G2 and Caps have been able to generate the pressure and just the advantages, the certain matchups that you can get with this champion rolling in the mid lane. That is one of the advantages that we have seen from G2. But the advantage in the favor of T1 throughout the day was Broken Blade in that top. It was not broke. What? Well, it kind of was Broken Blade in that top side. It was Zeus, excuse me and what he was yeah. doing to Broken Blade in the top side. Broken Blade manages to get himself those advantages, those kills, the individual performance early in this game three, but it didn't matter because of the way the waves were and what and how Zeus was able to respond to that with D1. He was never too far behind, and this rumble, it had the damage when it needed it. Yeah, and you know, despite being down, I think BB was down like 40 CS at one point, despite having some of these kills, but they even it out. Caps and Han Sama are so fed off of turret plates and turrets, but it's that one mid lane fight. Caps greeds a little bit for a couple extra minions. Kyria hits the insane Nautilus hook. We know the hitbox is a little crazy on that skill, but down 5k T1. How many highlight reels do we have of them winning team fights down 5k, 7k against any team? They have to be the most lethal team in the world from a deficit. The one team that you always got to be on the edge of your toes, knowing that they're capable 
of pulling off these fights of getting one advantage here nibbling a little here or there or getting the big home run and all of a sudden this game has changed and that's exactly what happens off of this play as you mentioned caps just a little bit of greed and it's so unfortunate because of how well he's played at this tournament how crucial and clutch he has been for g2 at this year's msi big time in comparison to last year's msi for g2 this is the story and you have this mistake come through and it is such a crucial one such a costly one because all of a sudden that snowball it's been pushed off the mountain from uh, from T1, and they are accelerating quickly to that end of the series. And what a strange series for Faker, because you have this Azir game where he's not, not even borderline. It looks like he's trolling on the rift in some of these deaths, and then you have this Talia game where he's ulting in 1v5 in the Baron pit, but it ends up working. It, the kind of bizarre adventures of Faker at this MSI continue. So strange, because again, game one, you get the traditional, you get the familiar and mostly under the radar type of performance of the Oriana kind of sticks around. The rest of the supporting cast is the ones making the big plays, making the big moments. Faker still steady in that one. Game two, not so steady. Makes that mistake early, greeds, tries to get something, does not work out for him. And he does feel the wrath of the matchup against Caps, the ex expertise that he has on this champion and the rest of G2 constantly dying but he does end up start to get a little bit of momentum a little bit here back for him as he is dying and every time he is dying in that game somehow it worked out that there was either just a fresh wave to catch up in that top side or all of a sudden g2 is focusing big time on pushing bot lane so that just leaves his ear open to take a tower or two up in the top side in, re in response type of thing so he always had that economy coming through and still was a factor later in the game in game three even one of these ones where there still are the advantages early for capped you get the big time clutch play that we all know he always is able cap and capable and you can trust him to bust out when you need it the big baron steal and listen zeus is the story of the series because of his level up was the main difference but we're, we're almost now just accustomed and expecting the consistent near perfection performance out of Gumi Yushi. It doesn't matter if the rest of T1 is in a slump struggling, he's the lone bright light. And if the rest of the team is playing at a high level, then Guma just ascends to absolutely untouchable status. But just another consistently fantastic series from start to finish from him. It feels like we're going crazy over the new, you know, uh, bright LED uh, flashlight headlights that we put into the car. Not going crazy over the fact that the engine warning sign is never going off on this thing. And that's because Guma Yushi is always delivering you those performances, that stability, that consistency that he's providing in that bot lane. Obviously, the synergy that he has along with Kyria as that duo is a major factor in that. But then the reliability that these other members outside of Kyria, that everybody else, the other three on T1 can have, knowing that they're ADC, is going to be there. He's going to have those skills. He's going to have that lethal instinct in a team fight, and he's going to farm up to be a beast when you need him to. That was Gumayushi. He had a rough time, I think, individually in that BLG series compared to someone like Elk on the other side. Very strong bounce back performance against a very strong bottling duo at this tournament in Hansama and Mickey. And he'll get his chance at redemption against Elk and the boys of BLG. But now, G2 as a whole, their tournament comes to an end. I know this is this is a tough pill to swallow, a rough way to end the tournament. Uh, you would have liked to have at least seen them pick up a game, even though they were competitive in games. Uh, two out of these three games, I'd say they were competitive. But shouldn't take away from, obviously, the top esports uh, big win out of them. And I think if you're a fan of EU, you're still happy with the performance G2 put up at this event. You can't be disappointed. I think, obviously... Uh, with this group and maybe you know knowing their own expectations there's going to be some level of disappointment in the performance and not getting it done on the day you do need to look back at the whole of this event and if you're g2 you're talking about of course the big series against t1 where you push them to that five games and the bounce back win against both psg and top esports and how you showed out in those ones and really rose to the level of this international that's needed at an international competition to contend and be a true contender to these t1s to the gen g's to the blgs and be into that conversation that's what g2 bought themselves 
Now, the important thing is keeping that momentum all the way through summer, not having, you know, mental boom, exhaustion, all these things that can come through and factor into it, and coming through strong at the Worlds event is the next thing in building off of this performance. I think a lot of people have reinstalled, reinstilled their faith in someone like Caps as the leader for G2 and what they can do and how they can challenge the established order and expectations of international events. But you need to see that continued onwards to the next international event, which is going to be our final Worlds this year. And they should, if you're G2, regardless of how the summer split goes, you should feel like we can compete with these Eastern teams. Yes, you need to play. You can't make many mistakes. You need to be playing nearly perfect out of yourself, but playing a little bit unorthodox in terms of picks and whatever, lane swaps, whatever it is, G2 can give them all that they can handle. And now uh, it's back to the, not back to the drawing board, but back to the easier region of LEC where they'll be going for that three-peat. And obviously T1's crazy gauntlet continues over the weekend. If they somehow... Managed to win this MSI. Going G2, BLG, Gen G back to back to back days. That's one of the most difficult runs since DRX World 2022. Oh, holy cow. What a run this is going to be. You, you saw it laid out. Whoever wins this one, which was T1 besting G2, lines, lines right up against BLG tomorrow. And then right after that, the winner of that one straight in to your match against Gen G. And yes, BLG and Gen G. Absolutely no slouches to go back to back. But especially no back to back to back after a full series, a focused and intense series against G2, no matter the scoreline here at this one. I, I want to make sure G2 comes away from this event feeling like a little bit, you know, puffed out in their chest type of situation. Even, yes, with this loss to T1, understanding that, yes, when you are going into these matchups against these Eastern teams, against the LCK and LPL expected favorites, that you have at least made it where getting that uh, getting that upset, getting that chance where you are the better team is a possibility to entertain. It's not just that random fluke chance that it appears to be for every other LCS and LEC team where it's such a low percentage, you can't really bet on it. You never think that it can possibly come through. With G2 and the way that they played at this event, they keep that rolling at the next Worlds. There absolutely is that chance and possibility any time of the day that they can pull it off against one of these top teams. They still look like they can be a top eight team at a world championship level if they're playing like they did at this year's MSI. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you beautiful people. Thanks for hanging out, and we will catch you on that flippity flip.